differential pair. I don't know why what they would be mean in so many different ways. Something called the source couple pair. Or emitter couple in this case. So this is a basic differential pair. Um, there are two alphas and there are two alphas, right? If you have a common mode signal, if you just have a common mode signal, what it means is that both voltages are the same. Both, both terminals are moved up and down at the same time. So in other words, they're shorter. Right. So I have one voltage that pulses both of these up and down. And what happens is that if I just move this voltage up, so let, let's say at, at some, some certain point I'm at one volt initially. So this is at one volt DC. Right? What would this voltage be? Approximately. 0.3 volts, right? If these currents in the typical milliamp range. This is 0.3 volts, about 0.7 volt drop, approximately. Right? Now, if I, let's say, change this to, um, let's, say, let's say I have a delta D of 1 volt. This, basically, in other words, I make this voltage 2 volts. What would this voltage be? Right. If it would be, again, it would be 1.3. If, if this voltage drop is 0.7, that's not going to change because the current through each one of these transistors is going to remain the same. Right? So let's say if this were 2 milliamps, each one of them are carrying 1 milliamp here as well as here. So it's not going to change. It's still carrying 1 milliamp. So VBE, which is determined by what? VBE is really VT <coughs> of IC over IS, is going to remain the same if other parameters don't change. So it will have the same VBE drop, but now instead of being at, one, at 0.3 watt volt, it will be at 1.3 volts. And you can see, now if I start moving this up and down, this move will track it perfectly. Just from, actually, from that perspective, this is nothing but, you can, you can basically take these transistors and from the input perspective, put them in parallel, right? Because these two nodes are shared and these two nodes are shared. So this is nothing but a follower, an ideal follower from here to there, for the common mode signal. For as long as they move together, it's just a follower. So this node does move, so it's not on virtual ground. If you have variation here, you will see variation. The same variation there. Actually. I thought differential mode signal, like, what do they at least a difference? Like, even in that case, we are calculating like, V and minus VD to get differential. Okay, now, in that case, so let's look at the differential case, right? So, let's say you have the same thing, two million. And now, let's say I'm at, at, I'm at some constant DC level, and then on top of that, I add the change here, right? So this change is, let's say, by 0.1 mil, uh, 0.1, let's say, one millimole. Okay, and this is pulled down by exactly the same amount, one millimole. That's a differential signal, right? Now, in this case, what happens? What happens to the snow? The voltage of the snow. Well, in general, you have to write the equations and all those things for large signal. But since these are small, you can actually look at the small signal model and see what happens for the small signal model. So this is alpha R M, alpha R M. Um, now, and, and what is this node? What, what is the effect of the current source in the AC model, in the small signal model? It's a constant, so it will be null, so it's open. So now, what I have, and what I see here is only the, the small signal part, the variational part. So I see a plus delta V here of 1 millivolt, and the delta V here of minus 1 millivolt. So this is going to go up by 1 millivolt, this is going to go down by 1 millivolt. What happens to this node? You have two resistors of equal length size, right? And you take one side up by the same amount that you're pushing down the other side. What happens to the middle point? Sure. Doesn't move, move, right? See, if you think about it, it's nothing but this, right? If I push this up by the same amount that I'm pulling this down, so this is plus V delta V, this is minus delta V. What is the current? If you can actually do it that way. It's 2 delta V, which is the voltage drop across, divided by 2R. Right? So the current is delta V over R. So what is the voltage here? It's this voltage minus that voltage drop, which is what? Which is I times R, which is delta V. Right? So this takes one delta V, this takes another delta V. So I, I'm starting at plus delta V, I'm going down at delta V, so this would be a zero. This is the midpoint of the seesaw. It doesn't matter. If I push it up and down by the same amount on both sides, and that, that by definition is a differential signal. The midpoint is not 
to move. So that's what's going to happen. But for color mode, this is what's happening. So the midpoints are moving up and down by the same amount. So the assumption that there's a virtual ground is only valid if the differential signal is small, right? If it's larger than... All right. I'm actually going to talk about that in a second. But yeah, that's a very good question. So... That might be piggybacking on this, but... Um, all right, so in the text it says that we can only use our small signal analysis as long as the signal's small enough so that we're not introducing nonlinearity. So do you have a good rule of thumb for when... Yeah, I mean, you can just sort of look at these curves, they go, all right, it's starting to get nonlinear around there, but... Let me put it this way. You can actually use a small... Use this. It depends on what you're trying to do. So that's a very good question. Let's talk about that. Depending on what... See, strictly speaking, the small signal model can be, by the way, a very short range. Well, actually, I can calculate that for you. I mean, I think we did that over several BTs, right? But I, I can do that. We'll do it in a second. I'll do it for a second. In a second. But strictly speaking, it's, it's applicable over a very small range. Actually, really strictly speaking, it's only applicable to infinitesimal signals. Well, as soon as it's non-zero, then there's some error. But the question is, how much error are you willing to tolerate? In fact, you use small signal models for things that are quite large signal a lot of times. Understand, knowing that, there will be an error in this. But it gives you a general feel for what the signal looks like. So basically what you're looking at in the small signal model is the first term of the Taylor, Taylor series expansion. Right? Mm -hmm. So you realize that there are correcting terms and you realize it's not going to exactly work, work out like that, but nonetheless you can apply it knowing that this is an approximation to begin with. So we do that very often. But just let's look at it from a strictly speaking point of view. Right? Let's, let's see what it is like. So let's say you have about, let's just look at a single common term. Right? And let's say I have some AC, B, B, and then I have some DC, B, B, parts, right? And then I'm looking at, well, I So I'm looking at the gain of this. I want to calculate the general transfer function. What is the general transfer function? Well, let's just look at the current for now. That's easier, but then you can multiply by the resistor and that gives you the voltage. So there's an IC plus IC. So what is the general, so the, this is the capital S. The total IC, right, which consists of IC, capital C, plus IC, this is the DC part, this is the AC part, this is the sum, is going to be what? It is IS E2, the total VBE, which we show like this, over VT, right? But total VBE over VT is what? This is IS. plus VBE over VT, right? Which I can write as IS E2 VBE over VT times E2 V, this is small component, VBE over VT, right? By definition. Now what is this? This is of course IC, or ICQ, this part, right?
square over 2. Okay? Plus terms of higher order.
But the, the point is that we actually apply them for a wider range. The reason we do that is that we understand there's error. But we want to see the general behavior. And depending on the gain of the topology, this range may be larger or smaller. If the gain is smaller, then this range will be larger. If it has a higher gain, then it will be smaller. Alright? So, any questions related to that? Now, small sequence model, it takes some time for you to make sure that you completely understand it well and become second nature to you. But you have to really work hard at it, and you should. Because without it, it's a very powerful tool that's used for a lot of things. Because the nonlinear analysis of many of these circuits is very difficult to handle, possible at all. Now, remember, so far and for this quarter, we won't even talk about the dynamics. Now, imagine throwing in dynamics. Imagine throwing in things that have, you know, like capacitors and inductors, which have memory, who create dynamics. How would you deal with a capacitor and inductor, by the way? Let's say you have some circuits. How would you deal with them? What is the way you use, what is the general methodology to deal with those in general?
So that's the complete model for this thing. Now, of course, if v i j and minus v i j are exactly opposite of each other, and these two are equal, what happens is that these two currents will vary by the same amount, the same absolute magnitude with different signs, and therefore the output voltages will only change in this direction, so the common voltage will not change. Right? But what if I have a bit small change, so they are not identical, so there's an offset between the two of them. We saw that in this case, actually, if you look at the equivalent half circuits for the left-hand side and the right-hand side, what do you see? So let's see, there are two different equivalent circuits. So from here to there, your gain, your common mode gain, let's say, now if I apply a common mode signal, what happens? I'm sorry, if I apply a uh, differential signal, nothing will happen in that sense. But if I apply a common mode signal, so let's look at the common mode signal. So if I have VIC and VIC, what do I see? Now, from this precise perspective, so what I can do, I can say, well, I can break this into two pieces for a common mode signal. Two REEs in parallel. And I notice that the input it's symmetrical, because they are the same voltage applied to both sides, so there will be no current flowing, so I can open it. Now on this side, what is the gain from here to there? RC or alpha RM equals two RE. Exactly. This resistance divided by this resistance, right? Um, times alpha. Two RE. Okay, so that's, what, that's, I'm going to drop alphas, okay? Doesn't matter, we can keep them in. But the essence is something else. So VO1 over VIC is that. How about this side? What is VO2 over VIC? It's basically the same thing that RC is replaced by. Yeah, so it's RC plus delta R divided by the same denominator. Right? <coughs> So now, the two outputs for a purely common mode input, right? The two outputs are slightly different. For the same input, I'm getting a different output here and there. So what is the differential output, VOD? By definition, it's VO1 minus VO2. Well, if I just drop a minus sign, so... Well, then these really have a minus sign to begin with. So that cancels it. So, so basically what I'm left with is going to be delta R over Rm plus 2 RE times VIC. So this over VIC is that. So what is this? This is the gain from a common mode input to a differential output. So even for purely common mode input, I have created a differential output because of this mismatch between the two sides. It's exactly given by this expression. So if delta R is 0, of course it's from 0. The larger the variation, the difference between the two resistors, the larger that effect will be. Right? So you can see that because of this effect of mismatch between the two sides, which is in this case it's because these two resistors cannot could not be made exactly identically on the same chip. Right? You make two resistors, you try to make them as, as the same as possible, but you can never make two things identical, technically speaking, right? It can be very close, but you can never make two things identical. Nature can. Electrons are identical. And indistinguishable. Right? So what happens is that, but in this case, this is a macroscopic thing, and you can make them identical. Therefore, you will have this error. And this can be substantial, actually. This can be 5%, this can be 10%. Okay? So that's one thing. That's one thing that can cause common mode to differential conversion. Now, I show you something else that's kind of implicit in this calculation. What is implicit in this calculation about the two transistors? I'm assuming they are kind of identical from a physical standpoint. Let's say, let's keep that assumption for now. Let's say I could make two identical transistors, just for the sake of argument. But there's something else that should be maintained for these two GMs to be equal. Yes, but, but it's true. But something else that needs to be maintained constant is basically that the DC levels of these two sides have to be identical. So if I have some DC difference between the levels that are applied to two sides, in other words, the stage is steered to begin with, it 
it's, made, it's not maintained at an equal voltage on both sides. It's kind of slightly uh, slanted to one side. What happens is that one of the transistors will have a constant current, right, without applying an AC current for now, but it will be larger than the other one, right, by, by definition. Now, that will correspond, once the stage is steered to one side, these two RMs are not equal. Because the tra two transistors have two different currents. So this would be RM1 and this would be RM2. And if you do that, you will see that if this is RM1 and this is RM2, then the, there would be a more sophisticated relationship between them. So let's forget about this part, and if you ignore that, and just you subtract them, you will see that there will be something that depends on the delta RM. So this lack of basically elimination of the common mode, so, or this common mode rejection, when you go from common mode to differential, only holds when the stage is maintained balanced. And then you apply a small signal. If you, if you were at this, in this position where you had a larger voltage on one side and smaller voltage on the other side to begin with, and then you apply a differential signal, or in this case, a common mode signal, I'm sorry, a common mode signal, that would result in a differential signal on the output. So you have to make another way of converting this common mode signal to differential signal at the output because of this. In essence, any asymmetry in this stage, in this model, at the point of operation, can result in that. Now, some of them may not be significant, some of them may be more significant. So our job is to find the primary dominant effect and deal with that first. And that's what smart engineers do. What dumb engineers do, basically, they go and write down five different things and try, try to optimize all five of them at the same time, while well, four out of five are ten times smaller than the other one. They don't start with a big problem. Uh, going back to our pawn example, drawing the pawn example, you want to start with a huge Okay, anything? Anything else on it? Yeah. So, so if, I, if the voltage output is depending on the output, the difference is now the resistor, the collector mm -hmm. resistor, then how do you minimize it? Well, so, so that's the question. So, how do you deal with that? Well, there are ways to deal with that. So, first of all, the resistance value. The accuracy, the, total, the, the accuracy of the resistor depends on its W and L. So you make it out of a slab of semiconductor or other materials, right? And you, you have an opportunity to make a resistor. So now, if I were to, why, 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 why could it vary? Because these edges, to the first order, there are variations in the, the edges as well as the thickness of the material. So let's forget about the thickness of the material for a second. So these edges are not completely straight. There's some variations on it's a very small dimension, right? So when you try to edge them, you only look at an over edge and under edge on one side. So the next resistor you make right next to it, which is the other resistor, has to be, well, it has its own variations, which are not the same as the, the one you already have, right? So it looks like that. I'm exaggerating. But now, how do you make these two be closer? If I make this, these resistors, well, what determines this resistance, first of all? The total R. R is the ratio of W over L times some sheet resistance, which tells you how many ohms per square. So you basically count the number of squares you have in this, let's say you have four squares, so that would be, and you say, well, this, this layer is 10 ohms per square. So there are four squares here, which basically means the ratio of W over L is four, and therefore it would be four ohms. Now, if I make this twice as large, right, then I have the same variation. Let's say the variation has the same standard deviation or something like that. This would result in a smaller change in the resistance, right? Because it's a smaller fraction of the total dimensions of this resistance. So you can make them larger for one thing. But there's also, I mean, the ohms per square is not constant. That's not, that, that's the thickness and material uniformity. We'll get back to that too. But then let's just forget about it. There's so many things here we are trying to talk about. So let's do it one at a time. So now, making them larger is good, but what is the price you're paying for this? Land. Oh, one is the area, which is the price. The other thing, what is Noise. Well, price goes with the area, right? Did you say price? No, I said noise. Noise. Uh, why, why do you get higher noise? Depends on what kind of noise we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's a function of the resistance. If you make, if you keep it, if you steer both the W and L at the 
same time. The noise will actually remain the same. But now this is interesting because if you were talking about flicker noise, it actually becomes better when you make the device larger. We'll see that later. Maybe if you make a MOSFET larger, the flicker noise becomes smaller. If you if you scale it like that. But that's a different thing. That's, so it's not going to hurt the noise part. For heat generation? Well, it's actually helpful for, for heat too because you see, if there's a fixed amount of current going through a certain resistor, right? If there's a I squared R loss. Now, that heat is spread over larger areas, so it's kind of easier to dissipate in all those, so the temperature will not go as high. So in that sense, it's also helpful. There's one more thing. When you make things large, generally something happens. What, what, now, this resistance, we are assuming that these are ideal resistors, right? But these resistors are like a plate. Capacitive. Yeah. So you make the plate from the capacitor larger, so there are parasitic capacitors associated with these resistors. So you, you've quadrupled the area of this resistance. This capacitance has quadrupled. What does that do to your speed? Well, yeah, it brings it down, depending on how, whether or not this parasitic capacitance is the dominant effect. Because you could have other capacitors, for instance, the transistor capacitors, which could be 100 times larger. So in that case, it doesn't matter if you can handle the area increase. That doesn't matter because if I double and quadruple this, it doesn't matter. It's still 25 times larger or smaller than the I main capacitor. So, but it will not help the speed. It may or may not become a bottleneck. So that's one thing about matching. Now, as you pointed out, there are other things. So I assume that this old is for the sheet resistance or this ohm per square is constant, but it's not necessarily constant, right? Because when you think about it, if you look at the cross section of this, if you look at it for sideways, I'm, that assumes that you have a very kind of constant thickness material, but also you have variations in this dimension. And you can do less about that in your design, because that's something the family does, but the family can do a better job of that, of controlling the uniformity of these layers. Now, what is more important for us than these variations is that these variations are repeatable for adjacent transistors. So, there are two kinds of variations. One is this kind of ran completely random variation that, has, that can be completely different from one resistor to the other. The other thing is that, now, in the way you are making this, that, and this is a more commonplace thing for thickness, the thickness is controlled by time. You actually deposit the material or you etch things and things like that, right? The duration. Now, if you get, if you, if you do it a little bit longer, if you are etching them out, it becomes a little bit thinner. If you do it a little bit shorter, it becomes like a little thicker, right? But it happens for everything. Everything on that wafer is affected by the same amount, by the same ratio. So the ratio. So if two adjacent resistors are increased or decreased by 10%, both at the same time, that's not going to harm me, help, help, hurt me as much, right? That's not going to cause as much harm. Because yes, the gain of this stage will be changed a little bit, but there will not be a common mode of differential conversion. And, and that's why we generally, and you will see this over and over and over again, we want to design circuits whose features and whose characteristics, such as gain and other parameters, depend on ratios of things. Because if you make them out of ratios of things, of similar things, then you are less sensitive or insensitive in effect to this variations that happens at all across the way. Yes? Sorry, like, um, can, <laughs> can the uh, collector resistor share? We have two of them. Well, can, can it share just one resistor? How? Why? It's a, it's best of, that's all of the same common ground, aren't are they? The RC on top? Yeah, side. sure, but, but still, you have two resistors connected. That so you're saying that these two are connected, right? Yeah. And that's true. But how can you share a same? I mean, you need this middle, middle terminal. If, if you try to make it out of one big resistor, you need this middle terminal, right? Uh -huh. And then the position of that terminal is very important. It has to be exactly centered. Otherwise, you will create two different resistors. You could do that. I mean, I'm not saying that you can, but I can't see an immediate advantage for this problem. You may have some other advantage for other problem. If I were to remove those two RCs and put one RC like, common between both the branches, how does that affect 
and then one hour like this. Oh, so you have three axes. Yeah. Like this. So let's look at that. So let's not call this something else. But R1. Let's call this RC. So what, first of all, let me ask, I mean, you could do that, so I'm going to analyze it for you in a second, but why are we doing this? Uh, what well, is the objective of this? Uh, the thing is, like, when you have, let's say, two common RCs, like, for e, as you said, you can't really remove the two common RCs, because, like, no, otherwise, like, the current thing is there. But if I were to make those two, like, let's say, smaller or something, just, just so that the main purpose of that is to get the current, and then, like, ha have those two RCs smaller and have this one bigger, mm -hmm. sort of to, like, Make it less sensitive to our or something. Like but okay, so so that, that okay, that's an interesting thought. It doesn't work, but let me tell you why it doesn't. So first, we have to analyze this. Let's say I've given, let's say you know, we were given a circuit like this, and we want to see what is the differential gain of this thing. How would you do this? Let's let's do that first. That's first. So we have a differential element like that. How would we deal with that if we wanted to capture the differential gain? Well, let's say we have purely differential signal. Vid over 2, this is minus Vid over 2, right? And this is Vod over 2, and this is minus Vod over 2, right? I know that one of the ways to deal with these kind of circuits is to look at the equivalent half circuit or small circuit. I have to calculate the equivalent half circuit, right? But I only have one resistor here, so I have to create a, an axis of symmetry and split things around. Now, do you agree that this resistor is equal to R1 over 2? series with R1 over 2. For purely differential thing, everything is symmetrical, so what is this note? It's a virtual ground. So it doesn't move. So from an AC perspective, this is a virtual ground, so is this one. So from an AC perspective, what is my half circuit equivalent half circuit? So this is RC, and then there is R1 over 2, which is in parallel with RC, because these are both ground. So that, what is the gain on this stage? GM minus GM times RC in parallel with R1 over 2. So you were suggesting to make RCs very small. Right? But what does that do to my gain? It kills the gain. So your gain is controlled by your load resistance. Your load resistance really is RC, if, even in that case, is RC in parallel with half of R1 over 2. So if you make R1 very large and RC very small, R1 becomes inconsequential. Like not having R1. And how would this affect the common mode again? Uh, okay, well, we can look at the equivalent common mode circuit, right? So let's say, if, if these were common mode, we in common mode. So, well, from an AC perspective, I have to split this into two. One on the left and one on the right. This is 2RE and this is 2RE. Now, what can you say about these two sides of this resistor? They're going up and down together, right? So what is the current of this resistance? Zero. Zero. So what? It doesn't matter. So the equivalent common mode circuit looks like that. So the common mode gain is the same as before. Any differential element is not going to affect the common mode. Any differentially connected element, like that resistor. Because both sides end up moving up and down together. So it doesn't, basically, the resistor is not seen by the common signal. You look. Ah. What happened? I was thinking about something else. Oh, okay. Well, wouldn't you only be it's not like all. Wouldn't you only be interested in it if it wasn't a common mode? That's a good question, right? So ideally, the signal we are that's the point. See, the, the signal, the good signal, is differential. At least you want it to be differential. So but we do analyze the common mode part of it because that's the un unwanted part of the signal. And we want to see how that's controlled. But that's kind of a parasitic thing. But we analyze it because we want this the gain for that to be as small as possible, while the gain for the differential one is as well. But yeah, the good part of the signal is differential. Any other comments or questions? Alright. So now let's try to do something. Let's try to go back to our for instance, MOS pair, MOS differential pair and see how we can kind of improve the design. Let's say again, if we are going back to the question of how can we increase the gain. Right. And we are going to do something very similar to what we did for a single stage one, but this time we are going to do a differential pair. 
So let's say I'm going to have a, let's say I have a, MOSFET, dead pair. And let's say I want to start off with, and I don't want to use a whole lot of resistors in MOS because, you know, in the vanilla process, I don't have a whole lot of resistors. So what can I do? Well, one of the loads we looked at was this kind of loads, right? So if you want to make a differential pair out of this, this is what it's going to be. So let's say this is like 5 volts. And I want this to have a large gain. So let's say this ISS is whatever. Okay. Now, I don't need to worry about that. Um, some reasonable bias stuff. The first thing is that I know, these are losses. I know what is the gain, what the gain of this stage is. If I look at the equivalent half circuit for this thing, for the differential signal, what does it look like? It looks like this. Right? That's the equivalent half circuit for a differential signal. That's what it is. So we remember the gain of this thing was controlled by what? Do you remember the gain of this thing? They share the same current, so you remember it was the ratio of the W over L. You remember that? It's in your head, actually. And you remember because of the body effect of this guy, it was actually the gate ended up being square root of W over L1, W1 over L1 over W2 over L2, and 1 over 1 plus guy. Now, if you don't remember it, this is the way to remember it. What is, so, let's look at it from a small signal perspective. From a small signal perspective, if I have a V in, let's say V in, right? This current driving this node is GM1 VN, right? What is the total impedance on that node? Well, there are several elements here. What is the impedance looking down? Because let's say R01. What is the impedance looking up? We did that calculation before. So it has three components, right? There was 1 over GM2, right? In parallel, 1 over GMB2, the body effect, the back gate transistor, in parallel with the R0 of this transistor, R02. So the, it's a parallel combination of all these four resistors. But we know that 1 over GMs are much smaller than ROs. So it's pretty much GM1 over GM plus GMB, which is the parallel combination of the two of these 1 over GMs. So the total current driving this is GM VN, and VO is going to be minus that because it's kind of current being pulled out of it, times the total resistance of that node, which is dominated by this part, namely this. In other words, so this is GM1 times 1 over GM2 plus GMB2. So the gain of this thing, which is VO over VN, is going to be minus GM1 over GM2 plus GMB2, which is minus GM1 over GM2 and 1 over 1 plus chi. Right? By definition, GMB is chi times GM. That's the definition of chi. Now, what is it? It's a ratio of the two GMs. What is the GM of a transistor? I have a MOSFET, right? It's 2 mu n C ox W1 over L1 I D divided by square root of 2 mu n C ox W2 over L2 I D times 1 over 1 plus chi. So for as long as they share the same current, these guys cancel, and these are the same too. So that leaves me with the square root of W1 over L1 divided by W2 over L2 times 1 over 1 plus chi. Okay. So that tells me I want a large W over L for this transistor and a small W over L for that transistor. So let's pick some of So I'm going to, well, the first thing is that I'm going to say I'm going to have a minimum channel length for this process. This is, let's say, it's a very kind of old process and it gives me a minimum channel length of 1 micron. Okay? So I'm going to make this 20 microns over 1 micron. So I want to have the minimum channel length here so I get the maximum W over L. And I want to make the W over L of this guy as small as possible, right? So I pick 20, 2 micrometers over 10 micrometers. So rather arbitrary. So, what is this ratio? What is the ratio of the W over L? No, it's more than The ratio of W over L is 100, right? You just divided by that. This is, a, this is a 20, this is a 5. So that gives me a 100. So its square root is about 10. Now, let's say my chi 
is at 0.3. So this is going to be 1 plus 0.3, so that's about 7. So the differential gain from the differential input to the differential output is going to be about 7. The voltage gain for this thing. It's quite low. So how can I increase it? Well, I can try to make this larger and larger, make that larger and larger to a certain point, right? But first of all, I'm not getting, getting a whole lot because it's a square root dependent. And second, the device has become huge at some point. And that may not appear to be a problem right now, but if you try to run this device at some reasonable speed, then that could be a problem because it passes from hard. So there's a limit to that. Now, what else can I do? What is the problem? How does improve this game? I look at it, so well, it's really this ratios, but we saw this trick before. We saw that the problem is that actually you want this to be as small as possible. GM of the upper transistor, wants, you want it to be as small as possible. So you don't want all the current to go through that transistor. Right? If you could somehow divert some of that current away from this transistor, so you could put some lead current or we call it a leader sometimes. Um, and steal some of this current away. Right? Let's say you make this 0.4 ISS. And this is point for ISS. What does that do? What that what that, that does is to make this current 0.1 ISS and this current 0.1 ISS. While this current is 0.5 ISS. Right? So how much would it change my gain? Well this current instead of being ID becomes 0.5 the ratio basically becomes point well yeah, this is going to be 0.5 ID, and therefore this gain gets multiplied by square root of 5. Some 2 point something. So it becomes like 15. Of course, there's a little bit, you know, I can go and say, well, I can make this 45, and then you can go and try to make it, and we play this game as well. Right? Now, one more thing I could do is that I noticed that these new ends cancel, because they're both, well, new ends. Now, what if I made one of them a different quantity, like a mu p? A mu p is small. The mobility of the holes are smaller than the electrons, so I can take advantage of it. So if I could make my node out of a diconnected p fat, I could presumably increase my gain. So let's see how that works. Well, all I need to do is just to use a diconnected p fat and something that looks like that. And I can maintain the same ratios for now. And say this is was 20 micrometers divided by 1 micrometer. Sometimes you know, when you're in a rush, you don't write the micrometers, so you say, well, 20 over 1. So you know what that means. And it's not such a bad thing because it's a ratio anyway. Yes? When you say still current, you just put in a relatively low resistor. Like you create a drain and then. No, but I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to do in a second. How, your question is how do you make those current sources? We saw that before once, but I'm going to tell you again how to do it. It's, it's a transistor. It's a transistor whose drain is connected to that node, so if you maintain the gate at some constant voltage, so it becomes a current source. So it has a high output. It has to be high output, it's not a low output device to mimic the current source. Do you have questions? Okay. So now in this case, what's the gate going to be? Well, if it's an n fed and p fed, then let's look at that equation. This is generally still true, right? Because looking up here, you still see gm, well, gmp, but you don't see the gmb, because in this case, this is connected here. Right? This is a p fed. So we don't see the gmb. So it's the ratio of gm over gm, gmn over gmp. So ab is minus gmn over gmp. So one thing that does that for you, that, that does for you, is basically get rid of this body effect reduction. Right? Because you don't have a GMP point. So that's good. And now the ratio of these two is square root of 2 mu n C ox W1 over L1 ID over square root of 2 mu P C ox W2 L2 ID. And see these guys cancel. This one cancels that, and the mu n over mu P ratio remains. So this becomes square root of mu n over mu P square root of W1 over L1, W2 over L2. Now, 
ratio can be somewhere between two to three, typically. The electrons are more mobile than the holes. And uh, you know, think about the droplet versus the bubble. So it moves faster. Um, now, here, basically, let's say the ratio is two. So that gives me a square root of two times whatever I have before. So let's say in that case it was 100. So it's basically 140, uh, okay, 14. So I, and I could play the same trick that I played there in principle here and try to increase this beyond that. Now, what is the disadvantage of having this ratio in your game? Uh, it's process dependent. Yes, exactly. It's process dependent, it's temperature dependent, and there are two different parameters that, depend, that are related to two different physical quantities. Now before, the good thing about just having this ratio was that it's, it's determined, the game is determined by the ratio of two things. And you saw that if things change, probably they will, a lot of the change will happen in the same direction for both of them. So the ratios are affected less than the actual absolute value. So that's good. So the game could be constant. But now I have this term that they have to worry about, but still it's kind of like a square. So you score root dependent. So maybe okay. Now, what else can I do to increase the game? If I were to make a special pair, I need more game. But again, I could do the same thing that guy, right? I could steal some of the current away from the current source. And, you know, when I'm doing this, I realize that the more I do that, the better it appears, right? So if I steal was exactly 0.5 ISS, what would the game be? Well, there would be no current for those transistors, right? The diaphragm transistors. So they are basically off. They're inconsequential. Now, I basically, it's like taking a stage that looks like this.
because of the channel name modulation. So I make this, I don't know, uh, 10 over 5. Let's drop it. So 20 over 1, that's 10 over 5. Now, I have to give you some parameters. I have to give you what mu and c ox is. Mu and c ox is, let's say, 100 microamps per mole squared. And mu p c ox takes about half of that, 50 microamps per mole squared. I have to also give you dxd, dvds, which can, in principle, be difference, the difference between uh, nmos and pmos. But let's just, for the sake of argument, use the same one for both. So dxd, dvds, let's say it's about um, 0.05 micrometers per volt. Okay? Uh, I think that's all I need at this point. Uh, I actually need the ISS. So let's say ISS is uh, 2 million. Okay? Now let's see what the gain is. I need to calculate my GM. Right? My GM in the balanced stage is going to be 2 mu m C ox W1 over L1 ISS over 2, which is the current through 1 transistor. Right? Half of the current goes through 1 and the other half goes through the other one. So this 2 cancels that 2. So I have square root of 100 microamps per volt squared times um, W over L is 20 times uh, 1 milliamp. No, one million, right? Oh, sorry, two million. You're right. Because I just canceled that. Thanks. Uh, so what is that? So 20 times 100 microns is 2 milli, right? So that's 2 milli times 2 milli amps per volt squared, right? So that gives me 2 milli amp per volt. Or 2 milli zenith. So that's 2 millisiemens is the uh, transconductance. Now, what is my RON? Do you remember the expression for RON? It's L, it's L effect really, divided by IB times DXD, DVDS inverse. Right? So L effective is, for the N mass, is 1 micron, micro, uh, 1 micrometer, I'm sorry. Um, divided by what? What is the current? 1 milliamp times 1 over that, which is basically 1 over 0 0.05 milliamps per volt. So, uh, what do I get? I'm sorry, mil well, micrometers per volt. Uh, so this micron cancels that micron. Again, this gives me a 20, right? So it gives me 20 over. 1 milli times ohms. So that gives me 20 kilo ohms. Right? Now, how about ROP? ROP, the same way, it's L effective, ID. And if in general I have a different DXD, DVDS for the NMOD, NFET, and PFET, but let's assume the same one for both. In this case, now, in this case, L effective is larger, right? I made it 5. So this is 5 micrometers divided by 1 milliamp times 1 over 0.05 uh, micrometers divided by volt, so this guy cancels that, and that gives me 100 kilo. So I need to calculate the parallel combination, which will be dominated by which one, obviously, by RON in this case, because it has a shorter channel length anyway. So it's this, it's uh, 2 divided by 12 is 1, 6, 2,000 divided by 120. So it's 1,000 divided by it's 100 divided by 6. So whatever it is, it's something like 16. Yes, yeah, like 17, 16. Say 17. Come on. Or when you can with R. So that's 17 kilos times 2 millisiemens. Million and kilo cancel, so it's 2 times 17 is something like 30, 35. So AB is around 35. See, with this trick, we didn't gain a whole lot in the MOSFET. The, and the main reason was that the output resistance was not as low, and the transconductance was not as high as the case of a bipolar, for a given uh, 
transistor uh, for a given current. So how can I improve the game if I were to go beyond this? What can I do to this stage to improve this game, to increase the game? There's so many things you can do actually in this case. <coughs> yeah, but that's, that's one of, actually one of the hardest things you can do, right? I mean, because if you're given a process, right, and then you have to design with that. So you have to go to the fat, fat the foundry, and say, well, you know, why don't you change the process? And say, no, thank you. Exactly. 